I uh, started studying migration between Mexico and the United States in 1978. And I really uh, got uh, very interested and impressed by the kind of detail uh, an anthropologist in the field could collect on patterns and processes of undocumented migration, which in the late 70s was just starting to become a, a controversial and hot issue. And, it, and demographers historically have had a hard time studying international migration. The data uh, are difficult to come by. There's a lot of flaws. But I was really impressed with what uh, an anthropologist in the field could come up with. And so I got a little extra money and uh, uh, key punched, that's how old I am, key punched to his data in, in, into cards and put them into machine readable form. And we wrote a couple of papers analyzing the process of Mexico-US migration as it was unfolding at that point in time. And uh, that, that kind of proved to me that there was a lot of value to it. The papers got published and received some attention. And then in uh, I got my first academic job in 1980 at the University of Pennsylvania. I immediately wrote a grant proposal to the National Institutes of Health, uh, where Congress has uh, wisely put demographic research, uh, and uh, said, uh, proposed trying this out in a wider scale, doing it in four separate communities, a, a rural community that's uh, mechanized, a rural community that's traditional, uh, a small manufacturing town, and a neighborhood in Guadalajara, which is Mexico's second largest city to see uh, if this could be scaled up and become uh, uh, a regular process. And so we did the four s surveys in the, in the four communities, plus surveys on the U.S. side, where we don't really have a standard survey instrument. We have a, a set of, of, of tables that we fill in, and the ethnographer, the anthropologist, goes in and has a conversation and just puts down all the information in tables. And then we come back and enter that into the computer. And that was successful, uh, I think, and we uh, published a number of papers and a book called Return to Aztlan, which came out in 1987. And uh, at that point, I think I, I felt that we'd really proved uh, the concept of combining ethnographic and survey methods and doing field work in specific Mexican communities, finding out what's going on with a representative sample of people from those communities, and then finding out where they went in the United States and doing interviews on the U.S. side. And uh, so I wrote another proposal to NIH to say, let's, this is an important uh, problem. We don't have good data on it, but we, I can gather good data in this way. And uh, scale it up and do four to six communities every year and start building a database over time. And uh, they liked it. And uh, not only did they give me a five-year grant to do this, but they gave me what's called a merit award where I got an automatic renewal for another five years, uh, unless I really messed things up. And so I had 10 years of funding, and this turned into what became the Mexican Migration Project, was, which has really been collecting ongoing data on the process of Mexico-US migration since 1987, continually compiling and adding on to a database which is publicly available to, uh, to anyone all the time and using this to study the patterns and processes of migration. Uh, given the success that we had with the Mexican Migration Project, in 1998 we launched the Latin American Migration Project, where we took the model we developed in Mexico, and the model, when I, talk, when I say we, I'm referring to me and my colleague Jorge Durand, who's a professor at the University of Guadalajara, and uh, we took this uh, model and we applied it in different countries around Latin America, including a number of countries in Central America, so we could study Central American migration and look at the differences be across countries and, and, and how migration processes differ in different settings. So I've been studying uh, Mexican-U.S. migration pretty much continuously since 1978. And uh, for me, watching uh, the uh, immig U.S. immigration policy unfold over the past three decades has been like watching a slow-moving train wreck. Because I could see in real time what the effect of the policies were. I'd get my data in from the field and look at it and see what kind of effects that the that the policies were having on American poli uh, on, on Mexico-U.S. migration. And I could see from a very early point in the process that they were counterproductive and they weren't going to they weren't going to turn out well for, uh, for the United States or for the migrants or for Mexico. Uh, and I'm going to tell you the story about how that all happened. Um, uh, basically, um, uh, Mexico-U.S. migration, not only the militarization of the border, massive border enforcement, massive deportations, 
didn't solve the problem of undocumented migration. In fact, it made it worse. Uh, uh, as you can see here, we spent, t we, we really ramped up border enforcement between 1988 and 2008. Um, if you take uh, the number of Border Patrol officers in um, 1988 and, and rank that as 100, we see that uh, there was a 471 percent increase in the number of Border Patrol officers over that two-decade period from 88 to 2008, or 30-year 30, 30 period. Uh, and, um, no, 20-year period, what am I talking about? Anyway, uh, Border Patrol increased by uh, 1.4, uh, 14 times, 1,462 percent. Deportations, 1,393 uh, percent. Undocumented population uh, uh, also grew from, uh, by a factor of six. So you spent all this money, all this thing, and the undocumented population grows by a factor of six. So something is wrong. We did all this enforcement, and we actually increased the size of the undocumented population. And this is the estimated size of the undocumented population. You can see that it was, um, it was kind of going up s relatively slowly. It hits here. This is when the Immigration Reform and Control Act passes, which uh, legalized uh, uh, about two, 2 million of the undocumented migrants, so it falls. And then it comes back up and then basically returns to trend. And then something happens here in the 1990s. Uh, to dramatically accelerate the rate of undocumented population growth up to 2000. When the recession hits, it stumbles a bit, then it goes back up again, and then comes to uh, an abrupt uh, plateau here and never, never really starts growing again. <clears throat> um, I want to explain how this all happened. Um, what we have here are, uh, these are official data from the United States looking at uh, Mexican migration to the United States in three statuses. The blue line is documented migrants. The um, red line is temporary worker migrants, legal temporary workers. And the green line is a, a proxy index of undocumented migration, which is the number of apprehensions at the border, which by itself is a very bad indicator because it depends on the enforcement effort. But it's the number of apprehensions divided by the number of Border Patrol officers. So you control for the enforcement effort and then look, and then, and then look at the trends over time. It doesn't give you the number who are entering in any given year, but it tells you a lot about the, the, the trends over time. So what you see back in the late 19, in the early 1950s is that was the first border crisis in the United States, 1953, 1954. Uh, uh, 20 years of democratic uh, administrations came to an end. Uh, Eisenhower was elected uh, president. He appointed the former commandant of the Marine Corps as, uh, as, the, uh, as, as the head of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And uh, there was a recession uh, just after, the sub, uh, after we pulled out of Korea, a, a small recession. And there was the beginning of the McCarthy period. And uh, uh, you see that um, at that point there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was undocumented migration happening. Uh, and uh, uh, here uh, into the, where did it go, into the hundreds of thousands. Um, and this became a political problem. And, there were f this, and in the context of the McCarthy era, migration from Mexico was seen as the soft underbelly of the United States for communist infiltration. And, uh, and in response to political pressure, uh, uh, the INS launched Operation Wetback. Uh, uh, 1953, 1954, the first time we ever had a million apprehensions along the Mexico-U.S. border. Uh, and, uh, and if you listen to hardliners now, they'll say we need to return to Operation Wetback, a full-scale police action that's going to end undocumented migration, because that worked before. But if you really look at the data, what really worked before was um, Congress uh, had been slow to authorize the guest worker program. It began in the Second World War in 1942 as a temporary wartime measure. And then, uh, and then after the war, all, all those um, Okies who were coming out of Oklahoma in the Dust Bowl and going into the fields in California were now working in union jobs and defense plants, and they didn't want to go back to agriculture. And there were labor, labor shortages in agriculture. Uh, but Congress thought this was going to be a temporary program and, and wouldn't scale it up. And so uh, there were some braceros coming, and growers would tell the braceros, well, when you go back to your hometown, tell your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your friends, your family, that if they come back with you, there'll be a job for you. Uh, and uh, that was the start of undocumented migration. <clears throat> um, and Congress, um, this became a problem, and then Congress acted um, by funding Operation Wetback. I'm not getting the stylus. Oh, there it is. 
uh, and and what really brought an end to the border crisis and the end of undocumented migration was the massive expansion of the of the Bracero program. Uh, and you see that um, this all came to an abrupt end. There was very little undocumented migration in the, in the rest of the 1950s or 1960s. And this was largely due to the fact that the, border, uh, the um, Bracero program was expanded to about 450,000 uh, visas per year in the late 1950s. And at the same time, there were about uh, 50,000 uh, permanent resident entries fluctuating around 50,000 at that time. So in the late 1950s, we have a half a million people, half a million Mexicans entering the United States, overwhelmingly circulating back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. The, the thing that really changed the, uh, the panorama of migration was the 1965 uh, immigration policies. In 1965, Congress did two things. It abruptly ended the Bracero program, just unilaterally terminated it over protests from Mexico, uh, and because in the context of the civil rights era, it came to be seen as an exploitive labor program, which of course it was, uh, but what came after proved to be much worse. Uh, so they got rid of the Bracero program, and in 1965, Congress amended the Im Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, and they did this for very good reasons. It was the civil rights movement, and they sought to uh, end the racist system that had been put in place in, in, in preceding years, the Chinese Exclusion Acts, the Jap uh, Japanese Exclusion, the Asian Triangle, the, um, uh, the uh, national origins quotas that sought to keep Jews and, and Italian and Polish Catholics out of the United States. Uh, so they amended it and they replaced it with a new system instead of national origins quotas and, and ban outright bans on Asians, uh, on migration, mi migrants from some places. They replaced it with a new system where they set up a system of, of quotas based on labor market needs and family reunification criteria and then uh, gave every country in the world 20,000 visas. They phased it in gradually, so in, uh, by 1978 it was phased in in the Western Hemisphere and by 1976, it was phased in in the west, in the phase first in the eastern hemisphere, uh, by 1968. Then by 1976, in the western hemisphere, and so between the late 50s and the late 70s, you go from a, a, a circumstance where Mexico has unlimited access to to visas. The national origins quote is never applied in the western hemisphere, so there were no numerical limits on migration from any nation in the Western Hemisphere uh, until uh, 1968 when the 65 quotas, when the new system was phased in. So we, from the late 50s to the late 70s, we go from a system where there's a half a million Mexicans circulating back and forth overwhelmingly you know, for temporary workers, even the green card holders were mostly circulating back and forth to a new system where there are no opportunities for legal entry and, and the number of visas is capped at 20,000. So what happens? Uh, nothing had changed on either side of the border. The economic conditions were still the same. And moreover, after two decades of Bracero migration and a fairly open border, the millions of Mexicans had established contact with millions of employers and many employers in the United States. Networks had formed to facilitate migration and it was very easy just to sim simply keep going. And so following the migrant networks that had already been established, Basically, undocumented, basically the flows simply resumed under undocumented auspices. And you see a steady increase up until about 1979, 1980, when it peaks. And then after that, we get fluctuations, and it goes down and up, and then ultimately peters out in, in, the, in the 20th century. Uh, but this big surge in undocumented immigration was occurring here in, in the 1970s, 19, and 1980s, and into the 1990s. <coughs> um, and um, that really changed the picture because uh, instead of a half a million people circulating in and out of the United States in legal status, uh, suddenly we have a, a roughly equal number, we don't know the exact number, but uh, hundreds of thousands of people circulating in and out in undocumented status. And they're illegal migrants. And if they're illegal migrants, by definition, they're lawbreakers and criminals. And this sets the stage for the rise of the uh, Latino threat narrative in the American media, in American politics, uh, uh, and in public debate, uh, where immigration from Mexico and Latin America is, is framed as this terrible crisis uh, and a threat to America's well-being. Uh, and over time, three, two kinds of metaphors evolved. One was a marine metaphor, where undocumented migrants were a tidal wave that was going to swamp the United States, drown its culture, and inundate its society. Uh, 
uh, and the other one was a martial metaphor where there were alien, illegal aliens were alien invaders that were uh, launching bonsai charges at the border uh, uh, who were desperately being, uh, de and uh, Border Patrol officers desperately trying to hold the line to prevent this invasion from happening. They're going to occupy the United States and um, and uh, in some uh, uh, quarters, uh, they were going to reclaim la Mexican lands lost in 1848. And um, what I did to look at this was, uh, this it looks at mentions of immigration as a crisis, flood, or invasion in leading U.S. newspapers. Uh, the New York Times, the LA Times, uh, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. And you see that um, in 1965, these metaphors were not used at all. And then pretty much in, in, in highly correlated, pretty much parallel to the rise of uh, apprehensions along the border attributable to the rise in undocumented migration, there's an increase. And it comes to a peak about the same time that the undocumented inflow comes to a peak. And then it begins to fluctuate, just like the undocumented migrants, in tandem with social and economic conditions on both sides of the border. Every time there's a peak, however, there's another piece of kind of restrictive immigration or restrictive border policy that gets enacted. And this sets up a funny chain reaction that would have serious consequences. So we had an exogenous event uh, here that uh, just out of the blue, um, uh, there were all opportunities for legal entry were curtailed, cut off. And uh, this led to a rise in illegal entries which, of course, produced more apprehensions. And then apprehensions became the visible, tan, uh, tangible indicator of the ongoing invasion. You didn't see them when they were braceros and circulating back and forth kind of invisibly, but now they're getting caught at the border, and the apprehensions become this tangible proof of an ongoing invasion. And every time, every year, when the new statistics come out, the Border Patrol would call a press conference and say, we had hundreds of thousands of, of apprehensions along the border. This invasion is terrible. We need more resources to patrol the border to save America. And um, these got a lot of play in the press and um, produced these uh, threat narratives. And that turned the country in a conservative direction, which led to restrictive legislation, restrictive border operations, increasing the number of Border Patrol agents, increasing the size of the Border Patrol budget, all of which in the end produces more line watch hours. That's hours spent patrolling the border. And if you have more line watch hours, more people, more resources devoted to border, border enforcement, you get more apprehensions. And this produced a very powerful feedback loop. Uh, the, um, so there was a, a direct effect uh, here uh, that was exogenous. And that comes to an end around 1979 when the flows are restored to their old levels. But then apprehensions, even though entries are not increasing, apprehensions continue to increase because of this feedback loop. So more apprehensions produce more restrictive le legislation and, and more restrictive operations, more border patrol budgets, more border patrol agents, more line watch hours, and feeds back in a very powerful way uh, to produce more apprehensions. And uh, just to show the tangible effort, what we, tangible result, this, the top line, the bottom line is our indicator of the actual volume, the flow of undocumented entries. And the top line is the actual number of apprehensions we're seeing. So the apprehensions climb and climb and climb and come to a peak in 1986. Uh, 1986 is the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act, also known as IRCA. And uh, this uh, had profound consequences. It legalized two million people, as already pointed out, two million Mexicans. Uh, and uh, it, uh, but it simultaneously uh, criminalized undocumented hiring for the first time. Uh, so it made it illegal for uh, employers to knowingly hire undocumented migrants. Prior to that, it was not illegal to hire someone who was without documents. Uh, and uh, most importantly, it began what proved to be a multi-decade process of border militarization. Massive increases in border enforcement that proceeded in, no, in ways that were just totally disconnected from the underlying volume of undocumented migration into the United States. And when I mean a, a mass militarization, this is what I'm referring to. This is the Border Patrol's budget in constant dollars. Uh, and you see that um, for many years, it was running at around four, three to four hundred dollars uh, in constant dollars until 1986. Then it begins to go up very slowly. And then in the mid-1990s, a uh, 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 series of acts are passed in 1990 and in 1996 to 
accelerate the process of border militarization, and, uh, and it, it goes up. And it kind of peaks right around the year 2000 um, because the U.S. was a full employment economy. It was the economic boom. People kind of lost interest in border enforcement. And then 9-11 happened. And then the border became the front line in the war on terror. And uh, it went through the roof. Now, if you look at this graph of, of rapidly, massively uh, accelerating enforcement along the Mexico U.S. border, you bear in mind that the actual volume of undocumented migration stopped rising about here. So all this is overkill, and it's overkill that actually produces that feedback loop that produces a rising tide of apprehensions even though the underlying number of entries is fixed. <clears throat> so we massively militarized the border uh, with Mexico, and this, this massive policy intervention uh, had effects, and I'm going to tell you the effects, uh, and then I'm going to show you the data to prove the effects. So the effects uh, uh, the set of, uh, first set of effects are on border outcomes. What happens to people, Mexicans, who arrive at the border, having established uh, several decades of tradition of circular migration back and forth, suddenly they walk into a rising wall of enforcement resources. It literally becomes walls, of course, in the end. Uh, well, I'll tell you what happened. It transformed the geography of border crossing and changed the uh, pattern of destinations in the, within the United States. It increased the use of coyotes or border smugglers. As more enforcement was put on the border, people responded by countermeasures, hiring ever more skilled border guides. And this increased the cost of coyotes. Uh, it became more and more expensive. Um, but surprisingly, despite the massive militarization, there was no effect on the probability of border apprehension. It didn't go up significantly. It, it remained fairly flat. It went down and then it went back up, but it never really um, it provided much of a deterrent. And it actually, uh, uh, it had absolutely no effect on the likelihood of getting into the United States on any given trip over a series of border crossing attempts, as I'll show you. But it did increase the res risk of death during border crossing. So it increased the costs and risks of border crossing. And then, with this, this new uh, uh, decision-making context, higher risk of death, increasing costs, increasing risks, uh, new destinations, um, <clears throat> what are the effects on migratory behavior? Well, there, we find no effect on the likelihood of taking a first undocumented trip when you decide to become an undocumented migration in the United States, but we find that it dramatically decreased the likelihood of returning from your first undocumented trip and it did decrease the likelihood of additional documented trips and decrease the likelihood of returning from additional undocumented trips. So I'm just asserting that's what's happened. And uh, now I'm going to turn to non-federal data, non-official statistics. This is data from the Mexican Migration Project, uh, which is the project I described at the outset, uh, which we've been running in Mexico in, since 1982 and continuously collecting data up to the present day uh, since 1987. It's the to my knowledge, the largest and most reliable uh, data set on, on Mexican documented and undocumented migration to the United States. As I said, we collect complete histories of migration and border crossing for all household heads in the data set. Uh, we collect uh, detailed information on the first and most recent trips of all members of the households in our sample. And for the household heads, we collect detail, even more detailed information about the most recent trip from, uh, from the household heads, the most recent trip to the U.S. And we have hundreds of thousands of person years of observation uh, over many, many decades from this data set. What I do is I estimate models. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the key variable of interest is the Border Patrol's enforcement effort, the Border Patrol's budget. And so that I can make a causal argument that this was the causal factor, I use uh, 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 two-stage least squares and uh, 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 to, to estimate the causal effect and remove any endogeneity in the, in, in, in the Border Patrol budget itself. Uh, and I can talk about how we instrumented it. Uh, if you in the question and answer period. And then we, that's what we're mainly interested in. Then we're going to control for the rate of employment growth in the United States, access to legal visas uh, in the United States, which fluctuates over time, and the general wage rate, the U.S. minimum daily wage. And in Mexico, the wage is given in daily terms, so we converted the U.S. daily wage, the U.S. minimum wage into a daily wage for eight hours. <clears throat> 
Uh, and in Mexico, we control for the crude birth rate, the rate of GDP growth, the homicide rate, and the minimum daily wage. And we're going to control for all these individual and household level characteristics, so age, uh, gender, marital status, labor force experience, education, cumulative U.S. experience, uh, un, uh, number of previous U.S. trips, unskilled, whether the job in the U.S. is unskilled or skilled, uh, parent, you know, social capitals, parent, whether the parent was a migrant, has migrant siblings, spouse a migrant. This all comes from the MMP. We have a very detailed array of information about uh, the person's contacts with people who have U.S. migrant experience, and we control for the per proportion of migrants in the community, and uh, access to material resources like land, uh, uh, a home, owned home, and business uh, enterprise. We control for the region of origin and community size. So all that just gets controlled. And what we're going to end up with are fat, uh, graphs that look like this, where the solid line is just a raw calculation from MMP data, uh, the solid line is a raw calculation, just the, this is the observed probability of crossing at a traditional border crossing point. And so you see the solid line just gives you the raw calculation, and the, the dashed line gives you the effect of the rising militarization of the border, the effect of that border patrol budget instrument. So it's the causal effect of border militarization on whatever outcome we're looking at. Here it's the like, so we're holding everything else in the model constant at the mean value and just letting the Border Patrol budget vary over time. And um, so what we see here is that uh, for, uh, from 1970 through the late 1980s, uh, 70 to 78% uh, of all border crossings occurred at traditional locations, and by traditional I mean San Diego and El Paso. Two, uh, 70 to 80 percent of all crossings occur at those two border crossing points. Then suddenly uh, it starts to drop very rapidly, re re rebounds a bit, uh, and goes down. For all, there, This is bumpy for all kinds of reasons, but you can see the underlying causal effect of the border enforcement uh, is to produce this shift in ge geography. Because, of course, when you start militarizing the border, you militarize the, most, the busiest ports first. So in 1993, um, the Border Patrol launches Operation Blockade in El Paso, and in 1994, launches Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego. Uh, that's the, those are the first all-out militarizations of two zones. They started building walls, erecting fences, uh, uh, lining up uh, Chevy Blazers with Border Patrol officers every 100 yards looking at the border, Klieg lights, drones, footfall detectors, infrared, all in these two zones. And um, uh, what happens when a migrant runs into this unexpected wall of enforcement resources? They go around it. And so what we see is a deviation of flows away from California and away from uh, uh, El Paso into the Sonoran Desert and through Arizona. Prior to uh, the 1990s, Arizona had not been a significant recipient of migrants from Mexico since the 1920s and had been a backwater on the border with very, very few apprehensions. And suddenly the flows are mainly, uh, the biggest flows, 66% of the flow was into California. And there was a permanent deviation of the flows away from California. If you look at U.S. Census data, uh, from 1985 to 1990, Mexicans who arrived between 1985 and 1990, two-thirds went to California. Fast forward, 95 to uh, 2000, one-third went to California. 2000, 2005, one-third to California. 2005, 2010, one-third to California. A permanent deviation of the flows away from California and to new destinations throughout the country. Once you're uh, out in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, uh, in Arizona, you're a long way from the labor markets in Los Angeles, they, and they were pushed out during the 1990s economic boom when labor demand was skyrocketing all over the nation and the flows just kept going. And the fastest growing uh, uh, Mexican populations were not in California anymore, but in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota. So we see a pretty clear effect there. Uh, this is the observed probability of crossing with a coyote and the probability predicted from the Border Patrol budget. You see that back in the um, uh, 1970s, it was, it was very, still very common to cross with a coyote or a border smuggler. Uh, this The solid line gives you that trend, and it goes, goes up with some zigs and zags. And this is the trend predicted from the Border Patrol's budget. 
and what we know from our analyses is that back in the 70s, people, when they took a first trip to the United States, would almost always cross with somebody, either a family member or a paid guide. And in the vast majority of cases, it was about three quarters of the cases, it was a paid guide. But then um, they would take a second trip or a third trip. And the second or third trip, they're crossing from Tijuana into San Diego County, one urban area into another urban area. And the routes are clear. Um, the, and you learn the, the, pro, the, the rituals along the border. You get arrested, you get apprehended, you sign a voluntary departure uh, 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 form, and they bring you back to the border. You wait, and then you try again. And the odds are, over a series of two or three trials, close to the, the odds are you're going to get in. Uh, uh, but uh, instead of paying for a coyote after doing this twice, think, why am I paying this guy? I know how to do this. And they would shift over to uh, their own resources to get themselves across the border. And so not everybody crossed. Experienced migrants stopped using border coyotes to get them across. And, but uh, as crossing shifted from urbanized areas like El Paso and Juarez or San Diego and Tijuana out into open desert, high desert, uh, uh, scarcity of water, freezing cold at night, burning hot during the day, very rugged terrain, uh, very uh, scarcities of water. Uh, uh, they, uh, the, the, uh, they turned increasingly to coyotes to get them across because there were no cities on the, on the, US, on the Mexican side, no real big cities on the U.S. side. They needed to have staging houses, they needed to have water stations, they needed to have all these sorts of things, and, and it, uh, you needed a professional to guide you across. So they turned what had been a, a very common practice into a universal practice where now nobody crosses from Mexico to the United States without a guide. You've also pushed them into remote territory, and the, and the cost of the services go up. You need more equipment. You need cars. You need uh, ways to get across. You need staging areas. You need safe houses on the U.S. side. <clears throat> and it's more dangerous, and you're paying people for more risk. Uh, so the cost of border crossing goes way up. This is the observed trend in coyote costs and pr predicted coyote costs. You see the observed trend is, f is very flat. It costs about five to six hundred dollars a pop to get into the United States and then suddenly it starts rising and rising and rising uh, and goes up and approaches three thousand dollars by 2010. It's currently up above six thousand dollars in the most recent data we have. <clears throat> Um, and you see that's entirely predicted by the causal effect of border militarization. Before, what you got for a coyote for 500 bucks, they would take you through um, uh, Canyon Zapata between Tijuana and San Diego, and then they'd leave you to, uh, at a 7-Eleven in Chula Vista. You'd call your cousin in Los Angeles and come out and drive you, not driving at Interstate 5 to escape the Border Patrol's crossing point near Camp Pendleton. Just go on the interior routes, and then he'd take you back to LA and you get a job. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't much. But now, you're out in the middle of nowhere in the desert, very small towns on the Mexican side, small cities on the US side, and it's a lot more involved, and it's more risky, so the cost goes way up. Uh, this shows the effect of border militarization on the observed probability of apprehension. On the first attempt, uh, and that's the solid line here, so you see this is the observed probability of apprehension. It starts out around 0.4, goes down. Uh, the reason it goes down is because the, during the 1980s, the, the Border Patrol wanted to get more money, so they got in on the war on drugs, and they shifted their attention away from migrants towards drug interdiction. But then uh, drug interdiction um, um, lost its, uh, lost its uh, appeal, and then they started devoting more and more resources with the border militarization to uh, their original mission. And you can see there's a slight upward curve in the predicted probability, but nothing uh, terribly uh, uh, impressive. And the top line shows the likelihood of ultimately getting in over a series of attempts, because we have a complete history and we know whether they, how many attempts they made and whether they ultimately got in. So you can see from uh, 1970 to really uh, about 2005 or 2006, the probability is 95 to 100 percent, and for most of the time, 100 percent, you'll get in. So um, uh, the other thing, the, uh, the other thing that happened was observed deaths at the border increased. Uh, now we don't. From the MMP data, we can't 
get data on deaths because if you died crossing the border, you don't come back to report to us in a in survey. So what we use is the data sources that have compiled basically counted corpses on, in the border region and, and just totaled up the number and we predict it from the Border Patrol budget. And you can see that the rising death toll along the border follows pretty closely from the increase in border enforcement resources. So, um, uh, what's, a, what's a poor migrant to do? So uh, there's been this massive policy intervention. They've been part of an ongoing uh, institutionalized circular process of migration for decades. And if you discount a, a brief period during the Depression when it stopped, all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, and suddenly the U.S. throws this whammy in the, in the, in, in, in the works, and uh, all the situation has changed. They face higher costs of crossing, they face more risks of crossing. Uh, they're crossing in different places, far away from traditional destinations in California. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they know that the probability of apprehension is still low and that over a couple trials, the odds are pretty close to 100% that they'll get in. So what's a poor migrant to do? Um, well, they don't stop migrating to the United States. Uh, rather than... Uh, uh, they don't stop migrating to the United States because they know they'll get in, and they know there's a job waiting for them. Uh, and this shows the effect of uh, 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 prob this, the, this is the solid line is the, is, the, is the observed probability of taking a first undocumented trip. And you see it's very ragged. It bounces around. Uh, so uh, in the late 70s, it goes way down because that's the, Mexico's economic boom, the petroleum boom, the oil boom, and then the Mexican economic crisis in the 1980s, uh, and then it goes down again after it settled down, and then in the 1990s, it goes down, back up, and then during the economic boom of the 1990s, it goes way back up, and then it goes way, 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 way down and is presently close to zero. Uh, <clears throat> And um, this uh, dash line, as, as always, is the predicted effect of the border militarization, which is actually zero and non-significant in the model. But we do see uh, a, a, a long-term decrease and a, really a drop with the probability of migration dropping to zero or after 2008. And if more recent data that we've, we've collected shows that it's continued to be pretty much at zero since 2010. Um, and um, so what, what caused that? Why did it fall? And the answer is the demographic transition in Mexico, not the militarization of the border. In the 1960s, the total fertility rate in Mexico was seven children per woman. In, by 2000, it had reached 2.3 children per woman. And in 2010, it was 2.2 children per woman. And today, it's, hovering, it's going below replacement level. Mexico has become an aging society. Uh, and uh, migration is a very age-dependent process, like most, most demographic processes. Uh, the likelihood of migration ri starts rising in the late teens, peaks at age 21 and 22, then drops uh, rapidly and near, near zero by age 30. And if you don't migrate between the ages of, say, 16 and, and 30, you don't start migrating when you're over 30. And um, the me de Mexican demographic transition had two big effects. First, it reduced the number of people entering the labor force, and uh, it increased the average age of people eligible to migrate to the United States. So the average age in Mexico today is about 28 years old. Uh, back in the early 80s, it was about 21 or 22 years old, and that's the peak of the migration probabilities. <clears throat> So Mexico is basically aged out of the migration-prone years. The number of people eligible to become migrants is, is shrunk. Uh, and the average age of people who are theoretically even at risk, they just got older and older, and they're too old to start migrating. And so this is, this is the observed effect of, the, of, of the, average, the observed average age of people at risk of migration. And that's what's pushing everything down. There are some ancillary effects from the opening up of guest worker migration in the United States after in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, uh, and uh, uh, some effect of uh, of, uh, uh, of other things going on in the political economy. But the basic driver was, in fact, the demographic transition. And the demographic transition is is over, and it's probably uh, the, the drivers are not going to be coming back. 
This is the probability of first uh, migration uh, predicted from Mexican fundamentals, U.S. fundamentals, and all factors combined. So you see, if U.S. fundamentals were still going on, we would still have migration. And if the Mexican fundamentals were going on, we would st still, uh, still have migration. But in fact, the observed goes way down, and that's because of the demographic transition. That's what changed. The economic conditions didn't change. The demography changed. So the likelihood of taking a first trip was unaffected, uh, and it dropped off its own accord. The, of those who entered the United States, however, there was a big effect of border enforcement, and it dramatically reduced the likelihood of returning home to Mexico having gained entry to the United States. So you can see here that it shows the observed probability of returning to Mexico within 12 months of entry, bounces around, then it starts to fall, and then it actually goes down towards zero at the end. And this is the causal effect we predict from the model uh, using the border enforcement uh, border budget instrument. <clears throat> now, this makes sense in a lot of ways. So first of all, from a simple neoclassical economic perspective, if you uh, think of if migrants are migrating to earn money, uh, uh, then the more it costs them to cross the border, the longer they have to work in the United States to make the trip profitable. So back in the 70s when it was $500 a pop, and if you earned $500 in the agricultural fields in, in the Central Valley of California, it would take you a month of work, and then you'd be in the black, and you, and you could earn money, your target earnings, your target income, and then go home soon. But if you uh, fast forward to uh, 2000 and it's $3,000 a pop, uh, and you earn $500 a, m a month, you can do the math. You have to stay in the U.S. a lot longer to uh, make the trip profitable. So that's going to increase trip length. And of course, uh, the costs and risks of migration have gone way up. Border crossing has become very unpleasant uh, and rather dangerous and very expensive. And so what does a rational person do? They minimize border crossing. And they do this not by staying in Mexico, but by staying longer and longer in the United States, putting off going back to Mexico, trying to maximize their income, because they know it'll be difficult to get back in. Uh, and if they do, it'll be very costly to get back in. And so uh, 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 the pool of uh, uh, workers, which was heavily male during the Bracero period and during the undocumented period, um, stays longer and longer and longer north of the border. As that happens, um, they send for their spouses, there's family unification, they bring up their younger kids, and those younger kids are now today's dreamers, uh, and they join to, for family unification. And then, as couples in their 20s do, they have kids, and they're US-born kids, and they're US citizens, and you get all these families with mixed status. Uh, and that's pretty much what happened. So a basic conclusion from my analysis is that from 1986 to 2010, the United States spent about 34, $35 billion in border enforcement, and in doing so, transformed what had been a circular flow of mail workers going to three states into a settled population of families living in 50 states. They reduced the rate of out-migration while leaving in-migration unchanged, and they actually doubled the net rate of undocumented migration and doubled the rate of growth of the undocumented population. So we're spending three to four billion dollars a year to increase the net rate of in-migration of undocumented migrants. And it created this population currently of 11 million people, 11 million undocumented migrants, 60% of whom are Mexican immigrants, 60% of all Mexican, 60% of the undocumented population are Mexicans, and two-thirds are Central Americans. All while attempting to end a flow uh, that would, an undocumented flow that would have ended of its own accord by the year 2000. And this is the border between San Diego and Tijuana. Uh, actually, this is an old picture. There are three walls now. Uh, to, the, to your left is San Diego County. To the right is Tijuana. Uh, the border there is military land. It's part of a naval base. Uh, so there's no people living there. And it's an easy place to enforce. Uh, and to the right is Tijuana. You're standing on a hill. Your back's to the Pacific Ocean. And this is the Korean DMZ, just for sake of comparison. <laughs> and this is what we've got. We've got, this is the percent undocumented by, by region of origin, so about 60% of Mexicans, about half of Salvadorans, and about two-thirds, close to two-thirds of Guatemalans and Hondurans are undocumented in the United States today. Uh, the undocumented population is overwhelmingly made up of Latinos, 
very few from other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. It's a Western Hemisphere phenomenon. China and India, the two biggest nations in the world, are, account for each about 2% of the undocumented population. Since illegal migration actually stopped in 2008, uh, the people who live here on undocumented status are now been here longer and longer. Very, very few are only 16% have been here less than five years. Uh, uh, um, around uh, uh, three quarters have been here uh, for five years or more, and about uh, two thirds have been here for 10 years or more, and about, um, uh, about a third or more have been here for. Uh, 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 15 years. And every year this population just gets older and older and older. <clears throat> and um, the borders become a political symbol. Uh, and we've, we're, we're trapped by the rhetoric of border control. So in theory, Renato Rosaldo, who's an anthropologist, uh, the U.S. borders become a the theater and border theaters become social violence. Actual violence has become inseparable from symbolic ritual on the border, crossings, invasions, lines of defense, high-tech surveillance, and more. And in practice, Representative uh, Beto O'Rourke, who was running against Ted Cruz but didn't win in the primary the other day, there's a long-standing history in this country of projecting whatever fears we have onto the border. In the absence of understanding the border, they insert their fears. Before it was Iran and Al-Qaeda, now it's ISIS. They just never, they reach the conclusion that invasion is imminent, and it never is. <clears throat> and you can see this uh, in the 80s. It was the Cold War. <coughs> Ronald Reagan said terrorists and subversives are just two days driving time away from the border crossing at Harlingen, Texas. And the communist agents will feed on the anger and frustration of recent Central and South American immigrants who will not realize their own version of the, of the American dream. And if you want to get a sense for the zeitgeist, I recommend you download or rent um, Red Dawn, uh, this movie, in 1984, war film directed by John Milius. And it was the, stage, the screen debut of Ta Patrick Swayze and Charlie Sheen and Jennifer Grey. And the plot of the movie is you know, this open scene. You're on the plains of eastern part of Colorado before you get to the Rockies moving west. And, and there's a schoolhouse. And uh, there's a classroom. And then there's a black teacher in a classroom full of white kids. And so you figure the black guy's not going to last too long in this movie. And sure enough, uh, out of the sky poor uh, paratroopers thousands and thousands of paratroopers coming down, uh, and, and they turn out to be Spanish-speaking troops commanded by Russian officers, and it's the invasion of the United States, and uh, the, the, the black school teacher goes out there and says, what's going on, and they shoot him, and then the wrestling team uh, takes a pickup truck, hightails it out of town, stops at the guns and ammo store, and then goes up into the foothills of the Rockies, where they spend the rest of the movie launching a guerrilla campaign to free America from communist domination. That's, that, that's the zeitgeist. Then the pundits got into it, of course. Samuel P. Huntington of Harvard. Now, unlike past immigrant groups, Mexicans and other Latinos had not assimilated into the mainstream. U.S. culture forming instead their own political and linguistic enclaves from L.A. to Miami and rejecting the Anglo-Protestant values that built this American dream. The United States ignores this at its peril. If you actually look at the data, the U.S. continues in the long tradition of being a graveyard for languages. People come in here speaking languages, and with a generation or so, they're gone. Uh, and, this, and, and we did an analysis in, um, in Southern California, in San Diego and Los Angeles counties, looking at the persistence of Spanish language ability. We find that in the, uh, among the immigrant generation, there's a lot of learning of English, but of course they don't speak it quite as fluently as a native speaker. Among children born or growing up in the United States, they speak Spanish until the age of about five or six, then they go into the schools, and then it's very hard to get them to speak Spanish. And uh, English becomes their dominant language, although they can still have some kind of fluency, and by the third generation, it's gone. There are very few people who uh, speak the, uh, the language of their grandparents. And then Lou Dobbs, he had a good TV show going on for, for a while, where invasion of illegals was part of a war on the middle class. Uh, and, and he was, the, you know, of course, the tribune of the middle class, uh, even though he had a nice horse ranch in northern New Jersey that employed undocumented migrants. Uh, and then Pat Buchanan's my favorite. Um, uh, illegal migration was part of an Aslan plot hatched by Mexicans, elite Mexicans, seeking to recapture the lands lost in 1848. And this is a quote, if we do not get control of our borders and stop this greatest invasion in history, D-Day was chump change compared to what's going on in here. 
uh, I see the dissolution of the United States and the loss of the American Southwest culturally and linguistically, if not politically, to Mexico. Any Mexicans in the audience, you're in on the plot, I'm sure. And um, now we're in Al-Qaeda. Texas Congressman Louis Gohmert in 2013. We know Al-Qaeda has camps over with the drug cartels on the other side of the border. We know that people are now being trained to come in and act like Hispanics when they're radical Islamists. We know these things. We know it. And it's just insane not to protect ourselves. So how do you train a radical Muslim to act Hispanic? Governor Perry, it's a very real possibility that extremist group ISIS has crossed the border, and they could be taking advantage of this situation. There's a very real possibility that they've used the border for entry, and Jeff Duncan, wake up America with a porous border, we have no idea who's coming in. Now, if you're ISIS or Al-Qaeda, sure, if you're ISIS or Al-Qaeda, where's the best place to set up your platform for attack? Tijuana, where you face the most militarized border anywhere short of the Korean DMZ, where if you're a radical Islamist, you're gonna stand out like a sore thumb in Sin City South, where the cartels will probably kill you, uh, or where you go to Canada, where there are large Islamic populations, there's a relatively undefended border, uh, you can blend in, and when you wanna launch your attack, it's a fairly open process. Uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. And then um, the latest is the Ebola crisis. Uh, Scott Brown, when he was campaigning for the Senate, said people coming in through normal channels, can you imagine what they do coming through the borders? And he called for the closing the Mexico-U.S. border. And Marie, Marine Corps John, John Kelly, currently Chief of Staff of the White House, said he was in Costa Rica last week and encountered an embassy employee who'd run across a handful of Liberian men, the second, third had a, evidence, in preparing to be smuggled into the United States. There's so many flights from Liberia to Mexico. If Ebola, if Ebola breaks out in Haiti or Central America, I think it's literally Katie bar the door in terms of mass migration of Central America to the United States. So the border has become this all-purpose symbol. Whenever there's a threat to the United States, the all-purpose answer is more border enforcement. And it's being used now by the current administration as, the, as a trope to rally the Republican base. Illegal migration from Mexico has been negative for 10 years. It stopped in 2008. The population actually dropped by a million people from 2008 to 2009. Since 2009, the number of undocumented Mexicans has been slowly trailing down because there's more exits than entries. And the only way, reason it's staying roughly stable at around 11 million is because the small number of Central Americans who are already, who are always there are coming in. So illegal migration from Mexico has been uh, negative for 10 years. So obviously it's the perfect time to build a $25 billion wall uh, to stop them. Uh, and, of course, it's not about border enforcement, because if a flow is negative, putting a border wall is not going to make it more negative, because uh, there's no stop and there's no asset control on the way out. It's a symbol. It's a political symbol that rallies the Republican base for Donald Trump. He's signaling to them and to people south of the border that those people south of that wall are not acceptable. They are not they cannot be Americans, they will never be accepted American. It's our rejection of those people. And that's the political purpose. And the last lesson I learned, uh, a hard lesson I learned, not necessarily the last, the hard lesson I learned is that when Congress makes immigration policy, it doesn't think about immigration as a process and how they want to manage it in a way that benefits us and our, our, our trading partners. They think they, they use immigration policy as a gimmick to make points in American electorate, either for or against immigrants. They become a battle for domestic politics, and it's not about immigration as a real phenomenon. So I've talked too long already, so I will be happy to try to answer your questions.